So thank you for joining. I'm Patty Smith and I do programming and I'm thrilled to be able to get these three wonderful authors to come today. Um, we have J.B. Harris, Christine Knapp, and Kathy Sherbrooke. So J.B. will, yay! <laughs> thank you. J.B. will discuss her debut book, The Immigrant's Wife, which is a compelling story of self-sacrifice, courage, and devotion, inspired by the disappearance of her great-grandfather. Christine will discuss how her background in American nurse midwifery inspired her to write The Modern Midwife Mysteries, which is a series of three murder mysteries. And Kathy will discuss her book, The Hidden Life of Astor Kelly, which is an evocative and immersive story of a 1940s runaway model who decides to protect those she loves and her daughter who confronts the repercussions of her mother's secrets decades later. So the, the format will be each, each author will have 10 or 15 minutes to discuss their books and then we'll open the floor up to Q&A um, and we have a little table in the back that Buttonwood Books is running. Thank you. So uh, in case you want to buy any books which make great gift items. Um, and as a reminder, turn off your cell phones if anybody still has those on. All right. So without further ado, JB will take it away. Everybody. Um, I'm JB Harris and first I want to thank Patty and Buttonwood Books and my co colleagues here and of course all of you because it is such a beautiful day out so to come in and sit with us I really appreciate that. Um, as Patty mentioned my book is based on what I call a family history mystery. When I was I don't know, in my 20s, my grandmother was in assisted living and we were talking and she was telling me stories and she said, I remember a man when I was in grammar school, he would be sitting on a bench watching me swing and I always wondered if that was my father. And I looked at her kind of like she had two heads because I thought I knew who my great grandfather was. And she said, no, 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 that's my stepfather. My real father left when I was two. So of course, being curious, I said to her, well, what happened to him? Where did he go? Why did he leave? She knew nothing because that generation, her mother's generation, would not discuss it. So she had no idea who her father was, what his name was, and I come to find out she didn't even know her name because I, when I went through her materials and did all my research, I had always known, that, known my grandmother as having the maiden name Patrons. And when I was growing up in a half Italian, half Jewish town, people would say to me, oh, are you Italian? And I would say, no. And they'd say, are you Jewish? And I'd say, no. And they'd say, well, what are you? I'd say, Irish, English, and Scottish, <laughs> right? And that's the reaction I got. Well, come to find out, they changed her name from Patrons by watering out an eye on all of the documents because back then it was all fountain pens, so all you needed was a little water to get rid of it. And her name was actually Petrinos, and her father was Greek. So all those years I was telling everyone, no, I'm not Mediterranean, they'd say, are you sure? Apparently I was lying. Um, <laughs> So I went and I did the research and I was able to find out a lot of things. I was able to find out, much to my pleasure, that my great grandparents were actually married, because you worry about that. Um, I was able to find out that my great grandfather may have been that man sitting on the bench watching her swing, because by that time my great grandmother had remarried. He had not. And he stayed single until he was in his 60s. So I like to believe that was him coming to check on her, finding out that his wife had remarried and leaving the family alone because he didn't want to disrupt anything. Um, and some of that is in play in the book. What I did is I sat down and I wrote a nonfiction, as much information as I could find. I hired someone to help me with the genealogy because when I was doing this, there was no Google. <laughs> there was no 23andMe or Ancestry.com. You had to go into Boston and look things up in the library. So I did all of those things. I wrote down a book for my family history, which is about this thick when you mm -hmm. print it out. Um, but I didn't know everything and when I tried to sort of fill it in, it wasn't working for me. So my family had the nonfiction. I said, the heck with this, I'm writing a completely fictionalized book. 
So I've done something a little different than most authors. All the names in here of, real, of the people who actually lived are their actual names, but the story is completely fictional. Hmm. And the story starts, it takes place in 1913 Boston, and it's dual point of view, and it's the story of Anna McIntosh, my great grandmother, who falls in love with a Greek immigrant, Charles Constantinos, we call him Charles, but Constantinos Petrinos, who was my great grandfather. Um, and you can imagine in 1913 Boston that did not go over well. So they defied her parents, they bucked society, and they eloped. And then uh, she learned how to adapt because they had to move into the immigrant section of town because she was giving up you know, her family and everything she knew. She learned how to adapt. They lived happily for about a year. She was pregnant and he disappears. Mm. And he did not go out for milk and not come home. He left for a good reason. And what we get at that point is the dual point of view where we're hearing Charles's fight to get back to his family and Anna's fight to survive in 1913 Boston when a woman couldn't even have a bank account. So in the interest of time, I'm going to read you a little selection. I was going to read both points of view, but I think I'll just read Anna's. Trust me, Charles is interesting too. Um, this is after they've eloped, and you can see it's very early in the book, so I'm not giving much away. But this is after they've eloped, and this is when Anna decides it's time to tell her parents because she's just missed dinner. Staring at the communal wooden phone box attached to the wall, Anna sucked in as much breath as she could and let it out through pursed lips. She grabbed the earpiece after hearing the nasal voice of the Boston telephone operator come on the line. Anna stated her call information through the conical voice receiver. One moment, the disinterested voice said. Anna could hear the operator plugging in the connection. The line crackled and rang. She considered hanging up while simultaneously praying no one would answer and wishing to get this over with. Hello, Macintosh residents. Her sister's voice. Anna found herself both relieved and annoyed. Jessie knew she would be calling and need not have complicated matters by answering the phone herself. It's me. It's Anna. Are you okay? We've been worried something terrible. Anna, impressed with her sister's ability to pretend, almost warned her not to overdo it when her mother's voice came on the telephone. Where in tarnation are you? Are you all right? Her mother asked with an uncanny mix of concern and annoyance. I'm okay, Mama. She couldn't say more. The words wouldn't come. You missed dinner. It grew cold while we waited for you. The concern was gone. The annoyance remained. Where is she? Anna heard Jessie's distant shout. She played her part well. Hush and tend to the dishes, her mother said. I'm with Charles. It was not what she meant to say, but all her brain could make her mouth utter. Lord Almighty above, Anna Fraser McIntosh, you aren't too old for me to tan your hide. Whatever do you, her mother's voice retreated. When Mrs. McIntosh received bad news over the phone, she made a habit of dropping the line and having Anna's father take over. The imparting of worrisome news was the one time Mrs. McIntosh preferred the Uni United States Post to the telephone company. Anna, what did you say to upset your mother? Her mother still ranted in the background, spitting out phrases like, that Greek boy, an insolent and blatant disobedience. Anna suspected her sister now made herself scarce, or feigned shock with wide eyes and a slack jaw. I, I'm sorry I missed dinner. I, how would she say it? Spit it out, girl. Are you with that boy after your mother and I forbid you to see him? His tone, her, his tone was icy, impatient. I, we eloped. Eloped? He repeated in the way one does when trying to extract a word's meaning. Yes, we got married today at, the line went dead. Anna didn't hang up immediately. The realization that the operator had witnessed her shame prompted her to replace the receiver without another word. She stared at the box phone on the wall. It stared back, its bell staring wide-eyed, the mouthpiece a rounded O of surprise. It had a horrified look of judgment, an expression Anna knew would be mirrored on the faces of the Macintosh's nosy neighbors back on Levant Street when the news made its way around. Thank you. Thank you very much. Christine? Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having uh, us here. 
Cohasset elders, Patty Smith, Buttonwood, and all of you for coming. I uh, really appreciate it. Today I wanted to talk, as you know I'm a nurse midwife, a little bit about American Nurse Midwifery, how it started, a little bit about my background, why I started writing these mysteries, and my road to publication. So first of all, there's always been midwives, granny midwives, traditional midwives, and they have a great history. Not nurses, no formal training, but had great success and knowledge. I can't hear? But my books are specifically about nurse midwives. So in 1925, a woman named Mary Breckenridge, uh, very interestingly, she was a very wealthy American woman, but who lost, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me now? Had lost one child immediately after birth and one in a few months after birth. And she decided to take this uh, really personal tragedy and try to do something about it. So she believed that midwives could impact maternal uh, and neonatal mortality. So she became a nurse and then went to the UK and became a midwife. And she decided to focus on a place in the nation where there was uh, horrific neonatal and maternal mortality, and that was Hyden, Kentucky in Appalachia, and started what's called the Frontier Nursing Service. She actually recruited a number of uh, nurse midwives from the UK to come with her, young women. And they went from house to house in this rural population, and they had a legendary massive drop in neonatal and maternal mortality rates. There was a wonderful PBS special. I looked up, it's not in the OCLM library, but it's called Angels on Horseback, Midwives in the Mountains. And that was really the beginning of American Nurse Midwifery. It is available through PBS if anyone's interested. It is a great story. But anyway, the women who taught me were all British midwives. If any of you watch the show called The Midwife, that is exactly as they are. They're calm, compassionate, they're experts in the birth process. And that's exactly, there's never a raised voice, no matter what's happening, never a raised voice. They always believe you know what to do, you know who to call if you need help, so carry on. And once you finish your education as a midwife, so you uh, have a bachelor's in nursing and then a master's in midwifery, you take a national certifying exam and you can use the initials C and M, which is Certified Nurse Midwife, after your name. Now, apparently I wasn't thinking really clearly because I became a midwife in New York and then at that, at that point when I became a midwife you couldn't practice in Massachusetts, it wasn't legalized. So I had to move to California to a huge practice and then eventually came back when Boston and started the practice at Boston Lying In. And I've always worked in tertiary settings, never done home births, so my midwife in the story is a modern day nurse midwife but who works in tertiary hospital. The reason I decided to do this was I realized even a few years ago when I was at Mass General, women would call and they wouldn't know what a midwife does or what a midwife offers. And you know, I had written in my past, I had uh, written textbooks, hadn't ever been a fiction writer, but was really thinking long and hard, how could I get sort of a message more out about what nurse midwives do today? And I always loved the idea because, I don't know if any of you remember, but there were a bunch of mysteries called Cherry Ames Mysteries. And they were written, um, there were 27 mystery novels and Cherry Ames was a nurse. They were actually started in the 40s to help girls be interested in the nursing careers to help the war effort. And they continued to the 60s. And I loved those books and it was, she could solve mysteries what no men could solve. And it was always Cherry Ames Ski Nurse, Cherry Ames Army Nurse, Cherry Ames Camp Nurse. So I always had the vision that I would want to do this. And in fact, in the 80s, in the American Journal of Nursing, there was an op-ed piece, and it was about who will carry, who will update Cherry Ames. And I remember reading it and thinking, well, I will, which was ridiculous because I didn't write fiction, but I always sort of had it in my head. So I went to a lot of writing conferences, I got some good feedback, but I find I just really wasn't getting anywhere. And um, I had a lot of drafts, and I finally worked with an editor who <laughs> wrote back, and we worked together for a while, and she said, I love your plot, your characters and setting, but you need to read all these books to find out how dialogue works and how plotting works. So um, I thought, I remember I came home from work one day, and I thought, am I ever going to do this? But I thought, well, if you really want to, you have to dig in and do it. So I revised the entire thing a number of times and then tried to get an agent and sent out about 70 uh, queries to agents and you know it's always interesting I got a few no's right away which is good you know midwives are not for me which is fine um, 
I finally got an agent and she you know, edited it again and um, sent it out to some publishers and I, I had three publishers and these are small presses that were interested but I had one question for her. I said, are they all equal? And she said, yes. And I said, well, who will publish it first? Because I'm no spring chicken. And I thought, wouldn't it be awful if I finally got these published? And they said, well, too bad Chris isn't here to see that she got her books published. So that's why I went with the one who would do it first. And she's a great publisher. She immediately changed my title. She, um, a funny story, I'll tell you about this one. Uh, she sent me the cover for this. I said, I want a New England mansion on the coast. And I kept getting back something that looked like an Italian villa. <laughs> and so finally she said, I'm going to put you in, right in touch with the artist. Well, the artist was from Naples, Italy. Had never seen a New England mansion. I think she did a great job, but it was just kind of funny. Once I told her and showed her photos, she did it right away. Um, and the thing I didn't realize about publication was, especially with a small press, you have to have a website. You really have to promote yourself. You have to be on social media. Um, it's, it's just a lot more than I was suspecting. There's three books out, which I'll tell you about quickly, and then I have a contract for four and five, and um, they are all in the old colony system, and my publisher sold the rights. My, I, when I signed with my publisher, you signed the audio rights. She sold it to Tianto Media, and through Hoopla, the first three are all available on audiobooks, in, in, if you're interested. The other thing is there are, there is midwifery, in the book, there are a lot of obstetrical vignettes um, along with the mystery. So I'll just tell you the first one, Murder at the Wedding. Um, Maeve O'Reilly Kensington loves her job as a nurse midwife at Creighton Memorial in the quintessential New England seaside town of Langford. Nothing could bring her more pleasure than helping women usher new life into the world except possibly having a child of her own with her husband Will. In the meantime, she's happy to celebrate the feelings of those she treats and content to support her husband in his newly formed catering business. However, when Creighton Memorial's chief obstetrician suddenly drops dead at his daughter's extravagant wedding, catered by Will, Maeve's two worlds collide in the worst possible way. Suddenly, murder is on the menu and Maeve is desperate to help her husband and find out who killed the doctor. With the help of her wealthy acerbic sister Meg and quick-witted Boston Irish mother, Maeve sets out to solve a murder and clear her husband's name. Can she stay one step ahead of the killer? And the second one is the same characters, same town, a lot of murder in that town. <laughs> <laughs> Maeve O'Reilly is still shaking off last year's shocking events where she is a modern day midwife. Her husband the Will's catering company at Time for All Seasons is back on an even keel and they are now actively pursuing fertility treatment and adoption in the hopes of becoming parents. Meg, Maeve's older sister and Langford's premier real estate agent, introduces her to Montgomery Livingston, a Manhattan business tycoon known as the Takeover King. He's anxious to move his base of operations and his home to Langford, but some community members have grave misgivings about whether his presence will be a boon to the town. So misgivings that come to fruition when Monty is pushed off a widow's walk and falls to his death. And then the last one that's out right now is um, Murder on the Books, Books and Bells, Midwives and Murder. She has fully recovered from her hot pounding escape from a murder last summer. Now she and her husband Will are happily adapting to life as parents of an eight month old while also preparing for the birth of their second daughter. Will's catering business is blooming and Maeve's midwifery practice has blossomed under new hospital leadership. It's winter in the seaside New England town of Langford and the holidays are fast approaching. Maeve decides to make a last minute dash to the Langford Library just before closing and discovers the body of the well-loved library director in the snow. Did she have a medical issue? Did she fall? Is murder on the books? A tangled web does weave and Maeve and her wealthy Fort Wright sister Maeve are stymied at every turn. At the same time, jewelry thieves may have targeted the Handel Grove Senior Center where Maeve and Meg's mother and the ladies of the lobby reside. Those are four women who are friends with her mother. Holidays, murder, and robberies pile up on Maeve's, as Maeve's pregnancy marches on. Can the sisters solve the crime in their limited time frame? Will Maeve have the birth of her dreams? Will the Langford Library ever be the same? And um, book four, hopefully will be out in January, and then book five. And I guess my message I always say when I do a talk like this is, if you have um, a wish to write a book or um, are thinking about it, I would say I'm the poster person for never giving up because it's never too late. And um, if you really want to publish, you can. Thank you. <laughs>
and two more to come, and <laughs> that's impressive. Um, hi, my name is Kathy Sherbrooke. So delighted to be here, and thanks again, Buttonwoods, for being here and the Community Center for having us. And I don't know if it was said, but w if you'd like to buy a book, we're all obviously happy to sign um, those books for you, or as a gift, as Patty mentioned. That's excellent. Um, so I'm here to talk about my latest novel, The Hidden Life of Astor Kelly. This is my third novel. Buttonwoods actually has all three of them there. Um, and, you know, I think as different as all my novels are, the thing that runs through them, I was reflecting on this morning, is I really like to tell stories about women who are up against the odds of what culture expects of them, sometimes what their family expects of them, and figuring out how to navigate um, what they want for themselves against those odds, and even sometimes the difficulties of telling the difference of what it is that you are hoping to be in the world and you want to be and, and how, you, how you put that up against what the world expects of you and for a lot of women what the world tells you you absolutely cannot do. I really like women who refuse uh, to accept that as an answer. So whether it's contemporary times or my last novel was uh, mid-1800s deep biographical fiction about uh, one of the first women to lead the women's rights movement in this country, Lucy Stone, to complete fiction which takes place in um, 1940s Hollywood and also there's a timeline in 1970s New York focused on Broadway. Uh, it's a mother-daughter story where both women at different generations are really struggling with their artistic passions and how to find their own powerful place in the world. So Astor Kelly, the named protagonist of the book, uh, when the book opens, she has just arrived in Los Angeles. She has won a prestigious contest for amateur fashion designers in New York. Mm -hmm. And one of the prizes that comes with this contest is the opportunity to travel across the country and meet with fashion designers in various cities across the country in hopes of winning an apprenticeship. And when she arrives in LA, this is her very last chance because none of the fashion designers, all men who she met with across the country, have any interest in what she has to offer. In fact, none of them were expecting a young woman to show up at their doorstep. Like so many industries, fashion was incredibly dominated by men on the design and, and management side. Um, but Astor is, has real talent. Obviously, she won the contest um, and is still very hopeful. So she shows up at what is called Fernando's Boutique to meet with Fernando. Again, her absolute last chance or else she's going to have to take her return train ticket and return home to Newark the uh, Newark, New Jersey, the first recipient of this prestigious award, first woman winner, and first winner ever to return home without landing an apprenticeship. And when she shows up on Fernando's doorstep, um, nobody really remembers that she even had an appointment. So here she is with her hopes very high, um, and they very quickly get dashed, except that when Fernando takes one look at her, he realizes that she is, in fact, the missing ingredient to what he needs, because he has an opportunity to bid on all the business for a Hollywood studio called Galaxy Studios, um, because they're looking for someone to dress all their big stars when they're on the red carpet, when they're out and about, um, out for dinner. And this is the, this is the studio era of Hollywood, meaning that the studios really owned their actors. You worked for one studio, you were under contract, and so everything you did, everywhere you went, the reputation that you were building in and out of the studio was critical to the studio because that's how these movies sold over and over and over again. Um, and he takes one look at her, and she looks just like Lauren Bacall. And he says, I have to design for Lauren Bacall, and so I want you to be my runway model in showing the outfits I'm suggesting suggesting she wears. It'll really help me win the business. Um, and despite her best efforts to show up with flats on and glasses and her hair pulled back, 
she has experience on the runway in New York. That's how she fell into fashion industry to begin with, and he, he sees it as soon as he sees her. And so they basically make a pact, and I'm not ruining anything, this all happens in the first five pages, that <laughs> she will work with him and be his Lauren Bacall stand-in and be a runway model for him if he apprentices her. And so the two set off to win this, this major contract from Galaxy Studios, and they both become involved with really important people at Galaxy. Her with a man named Sam Sawyer, who's head of the studio, and him with their up and coming next great star, Christopher Page. And so one of the other things I was fascinated with is, you know, not only women are fighting upstream against cultural expectations. In Hollywood at this time, there were really two scares going on. One was the Red Scare that we've all mm -hmm. heard of, trying to root out communists um, and make sure that none of the actors were communists. The other was called the Lavender Scare, which was studios' mm -hmm. understanding that if any actor were found to be gay, that would be it. American audiences would no longer go see any of their movies and, um, and the movies would be worthless. And so Fernando and Christopher start this secretive affair. Meanwhile, Astor's in a relationship with the head of the studio. You can imagine there are a lot of um, secrets that need to be kept. And Astor makes some really um, unusual decisions in order to protect what she wants out of her life and also to protect Fernando and Christopher, which leaves her um, with a set of unexpected consequences and a set of secrets that she's forced to keep that end up reverberating even in her daughter's life years later. Um, and much like JB, I was inspired towards this topic um, also because of a family history, because my mother was a runway model in Hollywood in the 40s um, hmm. and came home a divorcee in 1953 with a young child, which was scandalous. Hmm. Um, ended up remarrying my father and they had four children together, of which I'm the youngest. But my mother refused to talk about that time in her life, so much so that she never even would tell my oldest sister who her father really was. So I was intrigued by the mystery. Um, and I should say that even though she refused to talk about it, she would every once in a while lapse into um, a memory. So when I found a piece of jewelry in her jewelry box, as an example, she told me that it had been given to her by her roommate in LA after her roommate had a heated breakup with Cary Grant. <laughs> <laughs> what, Mom? Cary Grant? <laughs> and then she would turn cold and say, no, 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 I don't want to talk about that. And then I found, I noticed, I finally mm -hmm. looked closely at a sketch um, in a guest room and realized that it had been Personally, personally autographed to my sister by Walt Disney. That was also a name that I knew pretty well as a child, but my mother didn't want to tell me about that. Um, and then one of the final straws was when I was sorting through an attic. I was a nosy child, writer, right, research, we love these things, and found a photograph of my, my mother with Bob Hope, and she lapsed into some memory about being on a private plane to Las Vegas with him, and when I wanted to know more, she saw my wide eyes, and she said, she said, all you need to know is things that look glamorous are often anything but and then would turn around and walk away. So I was both intrigued and terrified. I, um, you know, I was really worried that something really horrible had happened to my mother, um, which would explain why she wouldn't talk about her first husband and why she wouldn't talk about that time. And so like JB, though, this story, while I took breadcrumbs along the way um, to put into this book, including things I learned about the fashion industry because my mother was a runway model before and after her time in Hollywood, I, I, I had to create a fictional story. And so I considered my creative closure on what it was that happened out there. And I decided instead of just having something horrible befall my character, I'm always really interested when characters take agency and make their own decisions for good reason but then the unintended consequences catch up with them um, and the dominoes fall in a way that they didn't quite expect and then they have to deal with 
what comes next and what to do um, after that. So that's my um, character, Aster, and I think I will leave it at that. Mm -hmm.